In this lecture, we're going to talk about assessment of deformity, axis of the knee, and osteotomy rules. There will be lots of drawings in this lecture from uh, this book, Principles of Deformity Correction, by Dr. Paley and Dr. Herzenberg. So we need first to define some definitions here that we are going to use in the uh, next slides and to assess deformity. First thing that we would like to uh, define is what is the center of the hip. So the hip, as you can see here, the femoral head uh, uh, is uh, round in most of its parts. So most of the femoral head from here to here uh, is rounded. So the central part of this circle is the center of the hip. So you see here one of my patients that has limb length discrepancy. So if we would like to assess the deformity, the first thing is we define the center of the hip. So here is the circle here that uh, uh, has most of the femoral head from here to here. That circle here, um, uh, and this is the center of this circle. So this will be considered now the center of the hip. Center of the knee is slightly more complicated. Um, you can pick uh, many uh, uh, points as center of the knee. In most of the cases, uh, we use uh, the uh, point here in the center of the tibial spine as the center of the knee. This is the easiest way, which is the uh, center of the two tibial spine. However, there are other things that you can use. You can um, use the uh, center of the soft tissue uh, lining, um, a soft tissue shadow, I mean, uh, at the level of the joint. Uh, you can uh, uh, take the center of the tibial plateau. Uh, you can um, put the center of the femoral notch or the apex here of the femoral notch uh, or the mid uh, point of the femoral condyle. Um, all this um, will give you can be considered the center of the knee and um, you have to be consistent so if you use uh, on one side this uh, dot you have to use the same uh, 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 dot and the same um, uh, measurements that you use on one side on the other side uh, I'll tell you the easiest way is to use the center of the tibial spine basically mean um, in the uh, middle of the two tibial spine that uh, pick this point as the center of the knee so this is the knee here of the same patient that we saw the hip, and this is uh, both knees. And if you want to uh, um, the, now detect where is the center of the uh, knee, uh, as I said, most of the time, um, the, the easiest thing is using the center of the tibial spine. You can see it very e uh, easily here. On this side, it's not as obvious, but uh, you can pick this point as the center of the spine. You can pick here this point as the uh, center of the notch here or here. Again, you can, whatever you choose, you have to be consistent between two sides. You can measure the width of the uh, tibial um, uh, uh, condyle and go in the middle or the um, tibial plateau or the femoral condyle and go in the middle. Uh, you can uh, use the soft tissue. Uh, this is basically the, I would say, the least uh, favorable method. But uh, the method that we use most of the time is the center of the tibial spine. If it's not very obvious, you can use the plateau and go into the middle of the plateau, the width or the condyle and go into the middle. Or you can go to the um, uh, middle here of the fem to the uh, of the uh, uh, um, notch between the two uh, uh, femoral condyles. So all the, um, whatever you choose, you have to uh, use the same uh, basically the same parameter that you use on the right. Use it on the left. So if you pick the center of the uh, tibial spine here, you have to use the center of the tibial spine. If you use the uh, center of the notch here, you use the center of the notch here, uh, and etc. After we talked about center of the uh, hip and center of the knee, let's go to center of the ankle. Center of the ankle, uh, the most common uh, way I use is the talus. So I will go to the talus and uh, midway that we are, I'll choose that as center of the ankle. Uh, you can also go between the medial side of the medial mal and the lateral side of the lateral mal and um, uh, split that difference. Uh, uh, or you can go to the soft tissue. Um, again, the most common I use is the center of the talus to be reflective of the center of the ankle. So here is the same patient that we have been seeing uh, with the deformity. Uh, and um, this is now the ankle. So we want to, to see what is the center of the ankle. So the easiest thing, as I told you, you go through the talus and then you go to the area in the middle of the talus and you can consider that as the center of the ankle. So here, the same thing, the talus goes from here to here. So the middle of the talus can be considered as the center of the ankle. 
Another option is to go from lateral uh, to medial and bisect uh, that area and that consider that as the center of the ankle. However, the simplest thing is just go for the talus. Center of the talus is that's the center of the ankle. No, now let's talk about the axes of the femur. We have two of the uh, axes of the femur, a mechanical axis and anatomical axis. Uh, again, as I told you, all these pictures are from the uh, deformity, uh, principle of deformity uh, by Dror, Paley, and Herzenberg. So um, the femur um, has two axes, as we told, a mechanical axis and anatomical axis. The anatomical axis is very easy. Uh, you just go to the uh, cortex and then uh, the distance and then the uh, bisector, the middle. A uh, few times you do this and then you connect these middle lines and this will give you the mechanical, uh, the anatomical axis of the femur. So anatomical axis of the femur, very easy. You just go to the cortex, medial and lateral. Uh, you, you put the points and then uh, you divide by two. The center here, center, center, you get few of them and then you draw a line across these uh, centers and this will give you the anatomical axis. Uh, the mechanical axis is also easy. You go from the center of the hip to the center of the knee. If you notice, we talked about the center of the hip and the center of the knee. So if you connect between these two lines, that gives you the mechanical axis of the femur. What is the relation between the anatomical axis and mechanical axis? Usually in um, adult uh, with average uh, height, it is seven degree. Uh, the shorter uh, uh, the person, uh, the higher the angle. Uh, so uh, for uh, for very tall patient that seven degree may be less because it will the sen uh, if you imagine like the head is here and you draw the line here so the the uh, the line between the, anat uh, the anatomical and mechanical will be less less if the patient is short let's say that for example the femur is here the uh, and you draw the line from here to here so the line between the angle between this line here and here will be more so axis of the femur femur uh, because of its shape has um, a different mechanical and anatomical mechanical very easy center of the hip to the center of the knee we talked how to take the center of the hip and how to get the center of the uh, knee uh, mechanical you just go on the cortices and then uh, you put the uh, dots and then this uh, get the central dot between these two dots you do this three or four times and then you connect a line that will be the anatomical axis of the femur relation between them is about seven degree now after we uh, discuss the anatomical and mechanical axis let's see how we draw them so this is an x-ray of the femur uh, of one of my patients uh, you, uh, adolescent patient, you can see if we decided to do the anatomical axis, we go into the uh, femur and we draw the line bisecting the middle of the femur. So here is like you pick few points and you put the, uh, on each side and then you go into the uh, middle and then you connect the middle of the areas uh, of the shaft and this will give you the anatomical axis. So this white, white interrupted line is the anatomical axis. How did we get it? We, we picked few areas of the femur we put dots on the two cortices and then dot in the uh, middle between these two dots and then we connect the middle dots together that will give us the anatomical axis and the mechanical axis is from the center of the hip to the center of the knee we discussed what is center of the hip what is center of the knee so if you connect between these two this is the uh, mechanical axis of the femur if you see here uh, the uh, anatomical axis here is uh, seven degree valgus in relation to the mechanical axis. So here is the mechanical axis, center of the hip, center of the knee, anatomical axis in the center of the femur. How do we know the center of the femur? We pick few points. Uh, uh, we connect the uh, mid, uh, so uh, uh, here, here, and here. We put two, uh, dots on each cortices, and then we pick the center uh, 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 between these two dots, and then connect the central dots. This will give us the anatomical axis. Anatomical axis and mechanical axis has about seven degree, with the anatomical axis is in more vulgus. Now, uh, uh, after discussing the uh, center of the hip, knee, and ankle, and the mechanical and anatomical axis of the femur, uh, I'd like to discuss with you uh, some important angle that will help to analyze deformity. 
there is two angles that, uh, if you understand them, you can uh, basically uh, analyze more than 90% of the cases of the deformity. These are the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle and medial proximal tibial angle. Um, these two angles are extremely important. We're going to spend time on them because, as I said, if you know these two angles, more than 90% of the deformity you can analyze. So the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, so it's a mechanical uh, angle, and it, uh, so it will use the mechanical axis, and we discussed uh, in the previous slide what is the mechanical axis of the femur center of the hip to the center of the knee. This is one line, and the knee line is on the other side. In this case, um, uh, you um, uh, uh, draw a line uh, over the distal uh, uh, femur, uh, between the distal femur uh, uh, me uh, medial and lateral condyles, or, or in most cases, if the, uh, if the knee and the, if the distal femur and proximal tibia are parallel, you can use the uh, tibial condyle, uh, and this will be your angle. So a line of the uh, knee axis, which is basically the distal uh, femur or the proximal tibia, if they are, uh, if the both sides are parallel, and the mechanical axis. So mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is on the lateral side. It's 88 degree. So mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, 88 degree between the mechanical axis of the femur and the um, uh, uh, line of uh, the knee joint line, which you can use the distal femur or proximal tibia if they are parallel. The other uh, angle is the medial proximal tibial angle. The medial proximal tibial angle, um, it's 87, but I usually use the 88 for simplicity. So it's both are 88 mechanical lateral distal femoral angle and medial proximal tibial angle. I use 88 as a normal, and you have in both of them range from 90, uh, 85 to 90. So um, uh, this uh, is the medial proximal tibial angle. If you notice, there is no anatomical or mechanical here. Why? Because the mechanical and the anatomical axis of the tibia are identical. So the mechanical axis of the tibia, the same as the anatomical axis, you, you can just draw that line um, along the tibia as we uh, did before with the femur. You pick uh, two, uh, a point here in the tibia, you put two uh, on the cortices and then the middle, another point, two cortices in the middle and then you draw a line along the middle of the tibia that will present both mechanical and anatomical so the medial proximal tibial angle between the uh, axis of the tibia remember anatomical and mechanical axis of the tibia are the same so that's why we don't specify here and um, uh, the uh, knee joint uh, line which uh, you can use the tibial condyle or the femoral condyle if they are both parallel in most cases they will be parallel uh, unless there is some instability of the knee or severe um, uh, uh, osteoarthritis, but in most cases uh, the uh, tibia and the uh, femur will be parallel. So if you take uh, the knee joint line here uh, along the uh, tibial condyle and the uh, and the axis of the tibia, medial side we should be 88. So medial proximal tibial angle 88. The mechanical lateral distal uh, femoral angle 88. These two angles are very important and you need to uh, measure them in all cases. You need to get uh, very uh, comfortable measuring them and assessing them. There are some other angles not as important, but I, we will discuss. Uh, there is something called lateral proximal femoral angle. The lateral proximal femoral angle um, uh, is uh, this is a mechanical um, uh, uh, angle. Uh, so you go um, between a mechanical axis of the femur and the line from the center of the hip to the tip of the greater trochlea, and this should be 90 degree. So, um, uh, so uh, in another word, if you uh, the the mechanical axis of the femur, uh, if you draw a line from the center of the uh, hip to the uh, tip of the greater trochlea, this should be 90 degree. This should be. Uh, 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 an angle here of 90 degree uh, between uh, the uh, proximal part of the femur from the center of the hip to the tip of the greater trochlea and mechanical axis. So lateral proximal femoral angle is a 90 degree. This is a mechanical uh, angle and um, uh, it's between the tip of the trochlea and the center of the hip that will give you one line and the mechanical axis. Uh, there is uh, another uh, uh, angle, also lateral, lateral distal tibial angle, 
and uh, uh, it's 89 here in the book as I told you more, all these pictures from the book that we showed in the beginning uh, but I also used 90 to, for simplicity so I put lateral proximal femoral angle 90 and lateral distal tibial angle also 90 it's um, um, between the uh, distal uh, uh, tibia or you can use the talus if they are parallel and the axis of the tibia on the lateral side it will be 90 degree so uh, there is a um, uh, less important angle that I'm going to describe now. Uh, uh, one of them uh, is the anatomical lateral distal femoral angle. This angle uh, uh, has some importance in few cases. Um, it is anatomical, as you see here. Uh, it's anatomical lateral distal femoral angle. This is an 81 degree angle between the anatomical axis of the femur that we described before and the uh, distal femur or the knee joint line as we discussed before, and this is 81. If you remember, the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, which was in the previous slide, was 88, so there is 7 degree valgus between them with the anatomical axis in more valgus. Uh, so this angle, we don't use it as much, but it has some importance in cases as we're going to see some example. Uh, as we discussed before, the anatomical and mechanical axis uh, of the tibia is the same, so these angles should be the same. There is an anatomical axis that uh, we don't use as much, which is the uh, medial proximal femoral angle here. Uh, so the same line we described before from the tip of the greater throat to the center of the hip. However, the other line is the anatomical axis, and if you go on the medial side, that's a, a, um, 85 degree for simplicity. So the anatomical um, medial proximal uh, femoral angle is 85 degree. We don't use this angle as much. Uh, also, the neck shaft angle is about 130 degree. Uh, there is some variation between people. Uh, uh, in deformity correction, we don't use it as much. Uh, as I said, uh, the most important angle is the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle and medial proximal tibial angle and lateral distal tibial angle and to a lesser degree the anatomical lateral distal femoral angle. So these are the angles that I want you to know so that you can analyze deformity. Also remember that uh, there is some deformities that will happen in the uh, sagittal plane, so not all deformities in the coronal plane. Actually, most deformity will have sagittal and coronal uh, uh, elements, so it is important to analyze uh, the deformity on the sagittal plane. Uh, the, the most important two angles here in the tibia is the proximal, uh, 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 proximal posterior tibial angle, which is uh, 81 degree um, and 9 degree slope. So we have 9 degree slope will give you 81 degree. This is the proximal, uh, 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 proximal uh, 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 posterior proximal tibial angle and uh, the anterior distal tibial angle, which is 80. So how do you draw this line? Uh, uh, for the posterior proximal tibial angle, uh, so one line is over the uh, uh, tibial uh, slope, uh, the proximal tibia, and the other line is uh, over the uh, uh, shaft of the tibia. How do we know the shaft of the tibia? You pick uh, certain uh, areas and you draw two lines and then I uh, drew two dots and then the cent and then you find the middle between these two dots and then uh, you have a few dots here in the tibia that represent the shaft so you draw a line across that. Um, uh, so this line here along the shaft of the tibia and this line here along the proximal tibia, this angle between them is the posterior proximal tibial angle. Uh, as we said, we all know from our total knee that the slope is 9 degrees, so this should be an 81 degree. Remember this line that they uh, uh, intersect here, it is usually at the uh, junction of the uh, anterior one-fifth with the posterior four-fifth, so it will not be in the center of the uh, uh, tibial uh, condyle, it will be actually uh, anterior. So if you draw a line along the shaft of the tibia, as I told you how to know the shaft, you pick uh, some levels and then you draw the center of these uh, levels and then you draw a line along the centers that will get you the shaft, axis of the shaft, and then uh, proximal tibia, you draw a line and then the posterior proximal tibia should be 81 to give you 9 degrees slope. The dot that they intersect at is not in the middle, so they don't intersect here, they intersect junction one-fifth with the uh, uh, posterior forefoot. 
Um, uh, same thing here on the anterior distal tibial angle. Uh, you draw the line here along the shaft of the tibia, and then you draw a, 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 a line along the distal tibia between the anterior and the posterior tibia. And one important uh, 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 anatomical fact that I want you to uh, know uh, is that um, the tibia and a distal tibia is open anteriorly. What does it mean that the uh, distal tibia, when you get a lateral of your uh, of any ankle, as I'm going to show you in the next slide, if it's normal ankle, it is not uh, uh, perpendicular. So the uh, the distal tibia is not perpendicular to the shaft. It is actually 10 degrees open anteriorly. So this angle here is 80 degrees. So an angle from the uh, tip of the anterior tibia and posterior tibia and uh, another line over the shaft is 80 degree because there is 10 degree um, uh, uh, inclination or the ankle is open 10 degree as I'm going to show you in the next slide. Uh, the proximal uh, uh, angles, uh, they are uh, not as important. These are version uh, uh, angle. Um, uh, we all know the femoral uh, antiversion or retroversion. Uh, so um, uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, it's rotational issue. Um, uh, uh, so it's they are not as important uh, to analyze uh, in the deformity uh, uh, section uh, from the X-ray. Uh, it can affect rotation, of course. Uh, uh, but the one that I want you to focus on is the posterior distal femoral angle, proximal uh, uh, proximal posterior tibial angle, and anterior distal tibial angle. The proximal, uh, the posterior pro uh, distal femoral angle uh, is important in some cases. Um, uh, it is 83 degree. Uh, and how I remember is I remember like 83 and then 81 and then 80. So it goes uh, uh, from going down, it will go less. How you draw this line? Uh, you will go into the distal shaft of the femur. You will pick uh, a few levels and then you pick the center of these few levels like here two dots and then the dot in the middle, two dots and then the dot in the middle, two dots and then the dot in the middle, only in the distal part because we know that the shaft of the femur is uh, curved, so you, you depend on the uh, distal part of the shaft and you draw a line in the centers of uh, these dots that will get you the axis of the distal femur and then you draw a line uh, at the level of the condyles. How do we know that? Uh, that when you have the widest area here uh, of the femur, uh, that condyle here uh, uh, when it starts and then that condyle here when it starts anteriorly and posteriorly and then you draw a line. I'm going to show you um, an x-ray of the knee lateral, an x-ray of the ankle to understand exactly what do we mean by these lines. Uh, but uh, this angle here, the posterior distal femoral angle is 83. As I told you, you go from 83 to 81 to 80. So it goes slightly less when you go down. Uh, uh, it is the shaft, uh, distal shaft uh, line bisecting the center of that and then aligned from the uh, 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 start of the uh, anterior and posterior condyles of the femur. So these two x-rays will help us uh, understand the angle better. So um, here an x-ray of the ankles, you draw a line on the tibia. How do you get this line? You put uh, two dots here and in the center you put a third one. Same thing here and then a line in, uh, connecting these central dots will be the um, uh, axis of the tibia. And then uh, for, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, the other line is between the anterior um, uh, distal tibia and the posterior distal tibia. And as I uh, said in the previous slide, this line here is not perpendicular to your tibia. It's actually, it has a 10 degree uh, open anteriorly. So it's not uh, perpendicular. It's actually uh, open anteriorly slightly 10 degrees. So this angle here should be around 80 degrees. So it's between the uh, distal tibia and the shaft of the tibia. Shaft of the tibia, you can know it uh, easily, the uh, uh, distal tibia, anterior uh, distal tibia, and posterior distal tibia, and this line is not perpendicular, it's about um, a, a, a roughly 10 degree up. Uh, and here, uh, the, uh, the, uh, how to measure uh, the posterior uh, distal femur angle. Uh, 
so uh, same thing for the femur, the distal femur, you will put uh, dots on both cortices and then you will get the midline um, by uh, central dots connecting between them. And then uh, in the distal uh, femur here, um, uh, and uh, the anterior part of the condyle and the posterior part of the condyle and you connect them and the posterior distal femoral angle is this angle here should be around 83. Uh, so this helps you to analyze the deformity in the sagittal plane. So after discussing all the previous angles, uh, angles and the um, uh, axes, uh, I'd like to remind you that the most two important uh, angles that uh, basically can uh, uh, analyze the deformity in most of the cases is the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle and the uh, medial proximal tibial angle. Medial proximal tibial angle is the medial side of the proximal tibia with the knee joint. Uh, there is no uh, anatomical or mechanical because uh, the axis of the tibia, both mechanical and anatomical, is the same. Here, the medial uh, mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, um, which is 88, and this one also is 88. It goes from the mechanical axis of the femur from the head, uh, from the center of the head to the center of the knee, and another line across the uh, uh, distal femur. So, mechanical lateral distal femoral angle and medial proximal tibial angle, these are the two most important angles that you need to know, and it helps you to analyze the deformity in most cases. Another important concept in analysis of deformity, the mechanical axis of the limb. So we talk about mechanical axis of the femur and we talked about the mechanical axis of the tibia, which is similar to the anatomical axis of the tibia. But there is a mechanical axis of the whole limb, which is from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle. So uh, mechanical axis of the limb is the line from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle. And we always assist this uh, mechanical axis to the center of the knee. The distance between them is called mechanical axis deviation. So now we're going to speak about how to analyze a deformity. So the first step in any uh, uh, deformity analysis is to draw the uh, mechanical axis of the limb. So we, we discussed what is the mechanical axis of the limb. It's the line from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle. So you draw this line and then you assist this, the relation of this line to the center of the knee. We discussed also what, the, what do we mean by the center of the knee. We said the easiest thing is the dot between the two uh, uh, tibial spine. So if this mechanical axis is medial to the center of the knee, so the whole limb is inverse. If this mechanical axis is lateral to the knee, so the whole limb is in valgus. So first thing is you assist the you draw the mechanical axis of the limb from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle, and then you assist the relation of this mechanical axis to the center of the knee. If it's medial, the limb is in varus. If it's lateral, the limb is in valgus. And then the distance between this mechanical axis and the center of the knee, we call it mechanical axis deviation. Uh, so in normally, um, the mechanical axis of the limb uh, should be uh, either in the center or slightly medial to the center uh, uh, of the knee. So this is the normal uh, alignment in most people. So first step, you draw the mechanical axis, you assess the mechanical relation of the mechanical axis to the center of the knee, and then the distance is called mechanical axis deviation. So after assessing the mechanical axis of the whole limb and assessing if it's in varus or valgus, we would like to know where is this varus or valgus coming from? Is it coming from the femur or from the tibia? So we use the two angles that I told you are very important, the mechanical lateral distal femoral ankle and the medial proximal tibial ankle. So we draw the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle as we uh, explained in the beginning of the lecture. And if that uh, angle is outside the norm, we said that the normal, normal angle is about 88. The range is from 85 to 90. So if you have an angle that is less than 85 or more than 90, that's an indication that the deformity is coming from the femur. So if you have a mechanical lateral distal femoral angle that is less than 85, for example, an 80 degree, that is you that there is a vulgus deformity coming from the femur. If you have a 
mechanical uh, if you have a mechanical lateral distal femoral angle more than 90 degree that tells you that there is a various deformity coming from the uh, femur so we want to know if the deformity is coming from the femur or the tibia we draw the two angles i told you about mechanical lateral distal femoral angle medial proximal tibial angle if the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is outside the norm meaning outside from 85 to 90 the deformity is coming from the uh, there is a deformity coming from the femur if it's less uh, if it's uh, less than 85 it's valgus if it's more than 90 it's varus and then we draw the medial uh, proximal tibial angle if the if it's outside the norm the same norm as we said for the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle it's 85 to 90 if it's more than 90 there is a valgus deformity coming from the tibia if it's less than 85 there is varus deformity coming from the tibia so you draw um, uh, the mechanical axis and then you draw the two angles we talk about mechanical lateral distal femoral angle medial proximal tibial angle and then you see if they are within the normal range or outside the normal range and this will tell you if the deformity is coming from the femur tibia or sometimes it can come from both as we mentioned we were uh, when we were describing how to uh, draw the angles uh, the usually the distal femur and proximal tibia are parallel to each other in most cases sometimes if there is knee instability or severe arthritis the angle between the uh, line of the proximal uh, tibia and the distal femur will have more than two de degrees either open medially or laterally in these cases we consider that there is some of the uh, of the element of the deformity is coming from the knee joint itself this is not common however we need to mention that for the sake of completion of the uh, description um, so in most cases you will see the lines are parallel or less than two degree between them if there is more than two degree either varus or vulgus uh, in this case you have to keep this into account uh, you have to uh, be aware that sometimes there is combined deformity so um, in this example you will do the first stage first stage is you draw the mechanical axis of the limb center of the hip to the center of the ankle it's medial to the center of the knee you have mechanical axis deviation so this is various deformity this is the first uh, st uh, step in the analysis of the deformity and then you need to know if it's femur or tibia uh, that's the second stage so you, uh, if you draw only one angle here for example mechanical lateral distal femoral angle this is more than um, uh, uh, 90 degree uh, so uh, there is a, a various deformity uh, coming from the distal femur however you have to draw both angle because if you draw the medial proximal tibial angle you will see that also the angle is less than uh, 85 so you have a combined here various of the femur and various of the uh, tibia so be aware that sometimes there is combined deformity uh, for example clinically uh, most of the uh, blound disease has combined deformity uh, so you can see here this is a, a, the mechanical axis show that there is various um, you need to measure both angles that we said are very important mechanical lateral distal femoral angle and medial proximal tibial angle both of them are out of the range in the direction of the varus so this is combined deformity meaning that there is varus femur and varus uh, tibia so let's go now again and uh, uh, review so we had step one to know the overall alignment if it's varus or vulgus you do you do the mechanical axis of the whole limb next next step is you measure the uh, uh, mechanical lateral distal femoral angle and the medial proximal tibial angle and you know if it's tibia deformity femur deformity or combined deformity now we need to know which part of the bone is affected which is the third part so the third part is we want to know which part of the bone affected so first part we want to know if there is deformity or not if it's varus or vulgus second we want to know if it's tibia femur or both third one is what part of the deformity affected sometimes it's easy to <coughs> to know what's part of the deformity affected uh, especially in the mid shaft like here you draw the uh, uh, the uh, anatomical axis of the proximal part anatomical axis of the distal part here it is they cross in the area which is uh, uh, the center of the deformity we call it cora and we're going to talk about that uh, in the next slide 
Um, here, same thing in the femur, so we'll draw the anatomical axis of this part. You can use these lines here, as we said before. You put two dots and then the uh, center of this, two dots, the center of this. You draw the anatomical axis here, same thing here, anatomical axis here. Or you can use the norm, which is anatomical lateral distal femoral angle. You draw the femur here and you draw 81 degree, and you draw the um, proximal line, which is from the uh, pro uh, center of the hip and the tip of the greater trunk, and then you draw uh, the 85 degree proximal approximately here and then whatever cross here you have is also the core so sometimes in the mid shaft it's easy as you can see here you use the anatomical axis uh, of approximately and distally and where the intersect is where the deformity is so as we discussed there is something that is the core which is uh, uh, where the deformity is so here it is a simple case here uh, of mid shaft tibia deformity if you draw anatomical axis here anatomical axis here this is the point here where they um, uh, cross, and this is uh, the, the, where the deformity is. And that's called cora, which is center of rotation and angulation. However, you need to know that cora is not a dot, it's a line. So cora is actually, it's the transverse bisector of this angle here. So you have this angle here between the two lines to the anatomical axis here. So this angle here, uh, the the uh, the transverse bisector of this angle is the cora. So cora is not a dot. It's not this dot here, cora. It is actually a line here. It's the transverse bisector of the two um, uh, segments, and it is a whole line here. Or any dot in this line is considered a cora. And <clears throat> as we go here, we're talking about for, uh, correction of deformity. So if you, uh, you, ha you have to correct the deformity uh, at the level of the core, as we discussed, as we're going to discuss in the following slide. And in these slides, we will uh, show the difference between correcting the deformity on the uh, convex side of the uh, bone or in the concave side of the bone, uh, if you use the core here or if you use the core here. Sometimes the deformity in the bone is not obvious, especially when it's close, uh, close to the joint. Like this example here, if you see that x-ray, you won't know it exactly. Is the deformity coming from? Same here. So in these cases, we have to use our lines and angles that we used before. So for example, here it is a case of a tibia uh, uh, with various deformity. So where is the cora and what is the degree? In this case, we have here a big segment so you can draw the anatomical which is the same as the mechanical axis of the tibia as we discussed before and then you draw a line across the tibial uh, um, uh, 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 condyles the proximal tibia and you come and you draw 88 degree so you will draw an 88 degree uh, from the center of the knee uh, because that's what we know is the normal medial proximal tibial angle of course you can use the other side as um, indicator of what exactly the degree is but you can use as we said the 88 which is the degree that we use in most cases so proximal tibia center of the knee 88 degree and then the other line where they cross is the core and what what is this angle is the angle of the deformity so 88 from the proximal tibia anatomical axis crossing here that's the core um, here in the femur we usually use the mechanical as we said so you don't know where is the deformity here you come at the distal femur you draw a line and then you draw another 88 degree um, from the center of the femur that will give you the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle uh, um, that's the normal angle here and then uh, as we uh, discussed uh, the, uh, the the mechanical proximal angle is uh, you, the proximal angle always uh, you draw this line from the tip of the greater trochee to the center of the hip and then you draw uh, if you're going to use a mechanical you draw uh, a 90 degree uh, angle here so you draw 90 90 degree angle here um, from the center of the hip 90 degree to uh, 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 the tip of the trochee and the center of the uh, hip from the center of the hip you will draw 90 degree and then this will go here the crossing between uh, this um, mechanical lateral uh, proximal femoral angle and mechanical uh, lateral, uh, 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 lateral distal uh, 
femoral angle uh, is where the cora is. So you have here mechanical lateral distal femoral angle 88 degree or 87, make it 88 for uh, easiness, uh, and approximately uh, the uh, the mechanical axis is the lateral proximal uh, femoral angle. It's 90 degree uh, from the line of the proximal femur, which is the center of the hip and the tip of the stroke, and 90 degree from the center of the hip where they cross is the uh, uh, cora or with the deformity is coming from. So let's uh, use uh, what we have learned to, <clears throat> to solve this problem. This problem is com this patient is coming to you with deformity. So what's the first step? First step is you want to know what is the deformity and what is the magnitude. So you do the first thing, which we know is the mechanical axis. So you have here the mechanical axis of the whole of the whole lower extremity from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle. It's passing medial to the center of the knee. So this patient has various and this amount of uh, 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 distance or this uh, uh, deviation between the mechanical axis uh, and the center of the knee is the mechanical axis deviation. The more this number is, the more varus he has. Now we did that. This is now the first step. Now let's go to the second step. You want to know if this patient has various deformity of the femur or of the tibia. So we draw the two uh, famous uh, angles that I told you about, the very important one that you need to remember by heart, the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, the medial proximal tibial angle, both should be around 88 or between 80 and uh, 85 and 90. Uh, remember 88 for simplicity. So uh, mechanical lateral distal femoral angle here is 87. So that's good. He has uh, normal femur the medial proximal tibial angle remember there is no anatomical and mechanical because they are the same so the medial proximal tibial angle is 72 so the deformity now is coming from the tibia so now we go to the third step to know which part of the tibia um, it is so the third step is you uh, draw the uh, anatomical axis here or the mechanical axis of the proximal tibia or if you have a full length you can just um, extend uh, the uh, mechanical axis of the femur so here's the mechanical axis of the femur it should align with the mechanical axis of the tibia so you continue drawing this line so this line here now represent the mechanical or the anatomical axis of the tibia because they are the same it's the continuation of the femur and we know the femur is normal uh, and now we draw um, uh, the here the the, um, uh, uh, axis of the tibia uh, mechanical and anatomical is the same so you can use 90 degree from the talus or you can just use as I told you the shaft which basically you put dot here and dot here and then the middle dot here and dot here is the middle dot here and dot here in the middle and then you connect the center that will give you the center uh, the axis here of the tibia so where they meet here is the center of the deformity or the core center of uh, 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 center of rotation and angulation so this is the uh, uh, core this is where you have the deformity and the, this is as we're going to see later where you have to do your correction and the angle between two uh, the two these two lines is 30 degrees so you have a 30 degree various deformity in this area uh, so uh, the first step second step third step uh, first step to know the deformity second step is to know where it's coming from third step is which part of that bone is coming and to detect where is your core this was a, an easy example let's go for a slightly more difficult example so here it is this patient is presenting to you with this deformity uh, you can see if you go for the first thing, first step, center of the hip, center of the ankle. Uh, that line is passing medial, so it is the various deformity. So the, the amount, uh, the distance between that uh, 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 axis and the, uh, the, uh, the center of the knee. Uh, is the mechanical axis deviation. So the first step here shows the various deformity with that magnitude of mechanical axis deviation. So now after we mm, did the first step, we do the second step. Uh, we drew the angles, the two important angles we talked about, mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, medial proximal tibial angle. We know that um, from these angles, this deformity is a tibial deformity. So this patient has a tibial deformity. So we did the first step, we did the second step. Now we go to the third step. So in the third step, as we said, uh, we draw the, uh, the mechanical axis of the femur and we continue. This should be uh, uh, the uh, continuation of the mechanical axis of the femur should be uh, 
uh, the, uh, the mechanical axis of the proximal tibia. Another option is you draw uh, this line of the knee joint and you draw an 88 degree here, which is the medial proximal tibial angle, the normal medial proximal tibial angle, the 88 degree. So you have two options, either to continue the, the uh, if the femur is normal, is to draw the mechanical axis and to continue that, or you draw the 88. These two options should give you basically the same line, which is this line. Uh, and then uh, uh, after that you want to get the axis of the distal part in this case this is um, uh, much easier because it's um, uh, it is a straight line here uh, uh, the, it's a big shaft uh, segment so you, we will draw the line here across the along the shaft as we said you can put dots and then the, uh, the in between them the dots and then the uh, uh, center of between them So here, here, here it is. So this is uh, the um, uh, we draw the mechanical axis of the femur. We continue that. That give us the me the, the mechanical axis uh, or the axis of the proximal tibia. As we said, the mechanical and the um, uh, anatomical axis of the tibia are the same. Another option, as we said, you draw the line across the uh, proximal tibia and you draw 88. Both should be exact, be basically give you that same line. And then the distal part is easy. You will draw two dots and then the center, two dots and then the center, two dots and then the center. And you connect or you just draw 90 degree uh, from the talus where these two lines connect is the cora the center of uh, um, uh, rotation and angulation and the magnitude now you can measure this is a 12 degree varus deformity and here is where the cora is now let's go to a slightly harder example so we'll uh, do the same three steps first we draw the mechanical axis uh, of the limb from the hip to the ankle it is in various deformity because it's medial to the center of the knee the amount uh, uh, of deviations called mechanical axis deviation there's represent the amount of the deformity from the center of the knee to the axis so this patient has various deformity this is step one and now we go to step two this patient here has um, uh, both uh, lower extremity in front of us so we can uh, uh, have better uh, understanding of the angles so we draw the two famous angles the two important angles that i told you about mechanical lateral to femoral angle medial proximal tibial angle you need to memorize them by heart okay so this is the normal side here if you see the mechanical axis of the limb is exactly in the center of the knee from the hip to the ankle passing in the center of the knee um, it can also pass a slightly medial it's still considered normal however this is the normal side here and we see the mechanical lateral the femoral angle is 87 medial proximal tibial angle is 87 on the affected side medial proximal tibial angle 87 mechanical lateral the femoral angle is 107 so in this patient his tibia is fine his femur has various deformity so this is the second step and it tells us that this patient has various deformity so now let's analyze where is that deformity coming from so um, uh, first we will draw, we'll draw the, the anatomical axis of the uh, femur and the anatomical axis is very easy in the uh, normal part you just uh, 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 um, draw this uh, anatomical axis in the center of the femur you put you pick points and then the center of these points you pick points center of these points and then you draw a line here and then if you measure the degree between the mechanical axis of the femur and the anatomical axis of the femur in uh, most uh, adults with normal um, with like the average height it will be seven degree volgs keep this in, uh, point here we're going to use it later on in step three so in step two we measure two angles and we know it's femoral deformity so now let's go to step three to identify where is the deformity coming from we want to know uh, we know where, where in the femur it's coming from so we know it's coming from the femur from step two now step three where in the femur is coming from so we draw the me uh, mechanical or the anatomical both are the same of the tibia and we go up and we know from the previous uh, uh, slide that um, it, this patient exactly in the center so um, the, the mechanical axis of the femur should be aligned with the mechanical mechanical axis of the tibia should be aligned with the mechanical axis of the femur and then uh, uh, after uh, so we draw uh, as you see the mechanical axis of the distal fragments so we know that this is the mechanical axis of the distal part of this uh, of the femur and then now we want to draw the mechanical axis uh, of the proximal femur that's slightly uh, hard uh, but um, uh, uh, there is uh, two ways to do that 
you can either do the uh, lateral proximal femoral angle we talked about this so anything in the proximal femur uh, is aligned from the tip of the trunk to the center of the hip and then the lateral distal femoral angle the mechanical one is a 90 degree uh, it's a lateral and it's 90 degrees so this angle here so first step is you can draw a line here and from the center of the hip you draw a 90 degree Another uh, way, uh, uh, which is the uh, preferred way, if uh, if you think that there is any deformity in the proximal femur, is you draw the uh, the the axis of the femur here, the anatomical axis, uh, same way, dot center, dot center, dot center, and then uh, you have this line here, and then you draw a line parallel to it from the center of the hip, and then you take seven degree from that. Uh, so uh, um, if there is no proximal femoral uh, uh, deformity it should give it should, these two these two methods should give you the same line so uh, easy way uh, you draw the, the lateral uh, proximal femoral angle uh, from the tip of the trunk to the center of the hip one line from the center of the hip 90 degree uh, more um, uh, precise way you draw the anatomical axis of the proximal femur you draw a line parallel to it uh, from the uh, center of the hip and then you draw seven degree uh, from uh, that uh, from the same point seven degree in vulgus uh, that will give you the mechanical um, these two point these two methods should give you the same line and um, if there is no proximal femoral uh, uh, deformity and this will be the mechanical axis of the proximal segment and in this case is now you draw this line you draw this line this will be the cora this will be the center of rotation and angulation and the magnitude of the deformity here you can measure it at 22 degrees as i mentioned a few times before all these figures is from the uh, principles of deformity correction uh, by dr paley and harrisonberg uh, so uh, now we define where is the cora and now we can proceed with so now let's discuss what are the rules of osteotomy. So if you want to do osteotomy to correct a deformity, what are the rules that you should follow? So let's go to this example. Here is a, a simple example. You have a bone that has a deformity here. You have axes here, axes here. These uh, here where the two axes uh, uh, intersect. Here is the uh, bisector, uh, bisector of, the, of this angle, the transverse bisector of this angle. So this is uh, what we said is the cora. So you have here the cora of the deformity, the center of rotation and angulation, or the cora of the deformity is uh, along this line. As we said, cora is not uh, um, a dot, it's a line. So um, you should do your correction of the deformity along the cora. So you should... Uh, correct the deformity along any of these dots here so you should correct it either from here or from here or from here or even you can correct it from here or from here any dot along this mm, line should be uh, uh, acceptable um, to correct the deformity from so let's say that you decided to correct the deformity from the concavity of the deformity here so you're going to um, basically uh, 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 correct everything and uh, based on a dot here on this dot here so you you will pick this point so if you pick this point here uh, uh, to correct your deformity so basically you're going to bring this bone here uh, 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 or you can uh, talk that you bring this bone this way uh, on this axis here on this point here on this uh, using this as your um, uh, center of the rotation in this case you will um, uh, have to do a closing wedge so you have to remove a piece of the bone here and a piece of the bone here and then you bring this bone this way um, uh, so um, uh, if you want me to draw it so you're going to bring this bone this way here so you have to remove this piece of bone here uh, uh, so th if you decided to do a, a correction over the concave area uh, uh, which is this point here you're going to remove part and you're going to do a closing wedge osteotomy uh, another option is to use this point so let's say that you decide i want to do this point to correct my deformity so in this case here you will bring uh, 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 this uh, bones you want to use this here uh, to correct your deformity so you're going to bring the bone this way here um, uh, and the, uh, your axis is uh, here the center where you're going to rotate is here so here it is so let's go here in this example you can see so you pick this point here 
and then you're going to remove the you're going to move the bone from here to here so that means that you're going to have an open wedge here so if you uh, pick the conca the convexity uh, of the bone and uh, as your center uh, you will end with uh, opening wedge or in another word you will or you will end with some lengthening okay so you will end with some lengthening uh, so if you de if you decided to pick the uh, concavity you will end with some shortening if you decided to pick the convexity you will you, you will end with mm, some uh, l lengthening uh, you can pick the center of the bone so in the, like this example here this patient here uh, in this case we pick the center of the bone here so we we will compress here and we will open here uh, so you will open here and you will compress in that uh, uh, part here as you can see if you look here this is if you say use the center so you will compress uh, a part of the bone so this will be a closing wedge here and you will have an opening wedge here uh, basically this maintains the same length before surgery so um, uh, rule one if you do the correction uh, uh, of the deformity uh, at the center uh, at the core you will always end with a cent with with a straight line here so you see that uh, the proximal and the distal are aligned perfectly uh, uh, you don't have deformity you don't have translation and that's what you should um, try to do um, in most cases uh, and uh, picking in the uh, the point in the con uh, concavity uh, basically means that you will shorten or um, a closing wedge picking the point in the convexity uh, make basically mean that you're going to lengthen or open wedge you can pick in the center and compress part and open part um, you can um, even uh, pick another point let's say that you're going to put an elizabeth or put a frame and uh, you can even go here even more uh, uh, outside so long you are on the cora you will end with a straight line but this area here will give you some lengthening so um, uh, you will end with the bone that is basically here for example there is an equation that you can use but that will is a very complicated and I don't want to make it harder uh, just to mention here that you can um, if you're using for example Elizarov with real hinges uh, or even if you're using virtual hinges with the new hexapod uh, you can uh, pick any point on this the more you go into uh, the convexity the more lengthening you will gain uh, and the more length you will give uh, of course you cannot really go into the concavity more because that mean that 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 basically means that you're going to shorten a, a big huge amount of bone or the bone will hit each other and it will not work but you can definitely go to the convexity and the more you go out the more you will lengthen the bone uh, and there is an equation to go but i'm not going to go through that because it's going to make it very um, complicated but just to uh, have the the uh, the uh, uh, this concept in your mind uh, you can definitely go in any point along the cora here uh, and the more you go out here the more you will give the patient length but let's say now that you decided you don't want to do the osteotomy here you don't want to do uh, the osteotomy or the correction along any of this uh, line here which is the cora the transverse bisector line so you have axis here axis here this is the angle this is the transverse bisector line this is the cora you decided oh i'm not going to use that mm, uh, rule and i'm going to change the correction here it's uh, uh, let's say that this is for example a 30 degree correction so who cares i'm going to do the osteotomy here and give the patient 30 degree connection that's what will happen if you do this you will have a deviation of your axis so you have the axis here of the proximal the axis here of the distal maybe they are parallel but they are not over each other there is a translation here that happened so you corrected the deformity uh, in 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 a sense that you there is no angle anymore they are parallel but you did not correct the alignment here because you had you shifted the axis so if you uh, if you just depend oh i'm going to do the 30 degree correction from any way that will not work actually because you may end with uh, parallel axis between proximal and distal but there is a translation um, uh, that happened in this case so what to do in this case let's say that uh, uh, the the skin here is not good you cannot do osteotomy uh, uh, there is like a, some hardware here you cannot do the osteotomy you have to go above or below in this case you have to do a translation 
So the rule tell you that if you decided for any reason to do your osteotomy away from your cora, you have to translate. Of course, you translate medial or lateral based on the deformity and based on you did it proximal or distal, uh, but I just here to explain the concept for you. So let's say that this is a 30 degree angle, for example, uh, here's the cora. You cannot do the osteotomy here. You decided to do here. You're going to do 30 degree correction, but with that 30 degree correction, you have to shift. You have to shift the bone. So it cannot be only angulation. You have to shift. You have to do angulation and shifting so that you can end with a parallel. Uh, so uh, here um, uh, uh, we corrected the 30 degree. You see here we corrected the 30 degree, but it, we did not put the bone here. We shifted the bone here so that the axis of the bone is below the axis of the proximal. So you you will so you have an axis here, an axis here that is basically over each other exactly. Uh, there is a translation as you can see. Uh, uh, but uh, that translation here uh, uh, is only in this part, but the axis of the proximal and the distal is uh, aligned. So you corrected the angulation, you corrected the translation, everything is, is uh, it looks very good here. Uh, and that's what you need to do if you decided to do your osteotomy away from the core. So now let's give some uh, example about uh, correcting the uh, deformity away from the core. Uh, so this is here uh, one of my patients. Uh, she had previously femur fracture uh, in 2006. Uh, actually, and she was treated with a flexible nail, uh, healed very good. But in the same time, she had a, a type five, so she healed here. A good alignment of the femur, no problem. In the same time, a uh, few years later in 2009, she presented with this deformity here in the sagittal plane. She has um, a, a, a recurvatum deformity of the knee. So here's the x-ray of both sides. This is the normal side. It has the normal angle that we, took, we talked about before in the nine degree slope, which is 81 degree, the posterior proximal tibial angle, the sh uh, line along the shaft and li line along the proximal tibia, they should meet at the junction of the proximal one fifth with the distal, uh, with the posterior uh, four fifth, uh, and should be 81 degree because you have a nine degree slope. Uh, here is the other side here, there is a 20, um, uh, five degree difference. Um, uh, so if you draw the line across the proximal tibia and a line here of the shaft, there is uh, 20 25 degree difference between them. So there is a 25 degree difference. So what happened is this patient, at the same time that she had the femur, she obviously had type 5 the, uh, affection of her uh, uh, growth plate of the proximal tibia. So she, this part here stopped growing while the uh, posterior part continues to grow. So what happened is uh, 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 that continued growth created that deformity. So she continued to grow posteriorly, stopped to grow anteriorly. So she had all this uh, 25 degree difference. Um, and uh, uh, recurvatum deformity uh, of the uh, knee. Uh, this is an example where you cannot really do your osteotomy at the level of the cora. So we know where is the cora because it happened at the growth plate. She had a growth plate problem, so she stopped growing from here. She only grew from here, so um, we are sure 100% her, uh, her, her, her cora is where the uh, injury happened. But you cannot do the osteotomy here because um, you won't have enough fixation here. It will be very close to the joint, uh, and it's not uh, mechanically or biologically feasible. So you'll have to do your osteotomy distal uh, to where cora is. So this is a, an example uh, where you have to do osteotomy away from the cora and in this case you cannot just angulate the 25 degree you have also to translate so um, uh, osteotomy was done as you can see the osteotomy was done distal to the uh, uh, physis here so it was not done at the cora and this was fixed with external fixator and then gradual correction was obtained uh, using um, uh, hexapod uh, to uh, correct the deformity and do the translation as we discussed so here is the frame and here is the osteotomy. So we're correcting the 26 degree angulation, but as you see, it's not only a, a correction of the angulation, so it's not corrected here. We're translating the tibia distally, so it becomes a translation and angulation because we're not doing it at the site which uh, the deformity has originated.
So here is the final product, a, a correction of the deformity in both the AP and in the lateral. And in the lateral, you can see the osteotomy is not only angulation, it's angulation and the translation so that the mechanical axis uh, of the distal and proximal is aligned. And here you can see, here's the uh, deformity before we start, severe recurvatum. At the end here, you can see we did posterior translation. So it's not only angulation, it's angulation with posterior translation. You can see that the, the, the tibia here, the posterior cortex of the tibia, it was translated, we the, translate the whole tibia posteriorly. So if you draw a line here, uh, it uh, it connects with the proximal tibia where it should be junction of the uh, anterior one-fifth with the posterior four-fifth. So this is an example where osteotomy was not done at the cora, was done the uh, lower level uh, uh, distal to it. So we uh, did uh, both angulation and the translation uh, to have uh, an aligned uh, um, uh, aligned uh, mechanical axis so it's uh, if you do only uh, correction uh, angulation here you will have the uh, axis of the tibia here distally and axis of the tibia here approximately they will be parallel but uh, there will be shift so in these cases you have to move uh, uh, the uh, the distal segment posteriorly uh, because the osteotomy was not done at the level of the cora so there is angulation and the translation so that you can align everything uh, together so here is the final product after um, uh, healing and remodeling uh, if you can see here that this is how the anatomical has uh, uh, anatomical axis of the tibia should look like uh, in the lateral view so it's the junction of the and Anterior fifth with the proximal, uh, with the posterior four fifth, and there should be an angle of about nine degree. So the posterior the proximal tibia is about uh, 81. So in this case here, we were able to uh, uh, correct the deformity. It was uh, one. Uh, it was 106. It became now 78. So three degrees within uh, the uh, other side. Uh, and if you see here, we, it's not correction of angulation only. If we did, just did an angulation here, there will be the anatomical axis here of the di of the distal tibia and the anatomical axis here of the proximal uh, tibia. They will be parallel, but there will be a translation. Uh, and, uh, so the, uh, if you do the osteotomy distal to the cora, uh, you should not only angulate, angulate and the translate. In this case, the direction of translation will be posterior. And you can see here that the uh, axis of the distal and proximal is aligned uh, and despite the osteotomy looks translated but the uh, axis of the proximal and tibia is parallel and aligned Another example here that um, I'd like to show for doing the osteotomy outside the uh, cora. So this patient here, uh, old injury, as you can see, uh, gunshot uh, wounds here, uh, vulgus deformity, obvious. Uh, so uh, what makes sense is here is obviously the cora. So you do osteotomy here and you put a nail uh, or you put a frame and that should be a straightforward case. However, if you look here, the skin here is definitely not suitable to do an osteotomy. Uh, it's adherent to the bone. This is an area that he had a skin graft and a flap. So doing the osteotomy here may not be the best option. And it's obvious here you can see uh, that the skin here is uh, adherent to the bone. Uh, uh, osteotomy may end into a, a dead skin and exposed bone. Uh, so uh, um, in this case, you will not be able to do osteotomy at the cora. You may have to go either proximal or distal. So in this case, we decided to do the osteotomy above the area of the uh, cora uh, to avoid the problem with the skin. Um, and uh, we did this technique here. So we put that um, shans pin here at exactly at the level of the cora. And then uh, uh, using um, uh, uh, a, a cube here, uh, we did multiple drill holes. These drill holes uh, were uh, later on connected uh, and converted to the osteotomy. And then uh, what we did is uh, a correction of the angle and the translation. Uh, so this automatically give you the, the translation that you want when you correct the deformity. Um, this is a way uh, that uh, in both um, translation, as you can see, and angulation uh, using uh, uh, the dome-shaped osteotomy. So this is a dome-shaped osteotomy done uh, 
um, uh, by using you put a, a, a shans pin or here exactly at the core and then uh, you can use a cube or other measures uh, do multiple drill holes and then connect the osteotomy and then once you rotate here uh, this will uh, uh, correct the angulation here so you see it, it became now straight so there is no angle and in the same time you do the translation and the translation um, uh, here will result that the axis of the proximal and distal part be aligned and you can see here uh, this is the wire here that at the core this is the cube, uh, cube that was done uh, to do the osteotomy and and so here again the uh, the deformity and then that's exactly what we did here uh, uh, sh uh, shans pin multiple drill hole and then um, uh, and then after that you rotate uh, when you rotate a dome shape osteotomy it will create the translation and the correction in the same time so you can see here we rotated here we did multiple drill holes and then we rotated and then we uh, this resulted in uh, angulation and uh, uh, translation and that's what you want to do in order to have a perfect alignment and here is the end product here uh, uh, it looks here the osteotomy is not pretty there is translation however that's what you want because that would uh, what will allow you to have uh, um, uh, uh, axis of the distal and axis of the proximal aligned to each other if you just uh, root, uh, correct the deformity above the osteotomy with the angulation that would have resulted in um, uh, being uh, ac uh, the, the axis of the proximal and distal aligned uh, however it will be uh, in that position here so it will not uh, be accurate so you will have a, a axis here of the proximal axis here of the distal they are parallel to each other but they are not aligned so you have to translate while you do this the core the dome shape osteotomy allow you to do both in the same time uh, the the angulation and the translation and that resulted in perfect alignment here and here is a close-up view show, uh, showing what we discussed here this is the axis of the proximal this is the axis of the distal you can see it's aligned so the osteotomy here has been shifted but that shift in the osteotomy is what allow you to have uh, aligned uh, axis if you did not shift the osteotomy and you just did the, uh, the osteotomy angulation here above the, uh, the, uh, the osteotomy you will end with parallel uh, you will end with parallel lines here but they are not uh, uh, aligned to each other uh, so that's why you have to translate here and uh, that uh, dome shape osteotomy allow you to do both in the same time thank you for listening and i hope this lecture will help you in your exams and in your clinical practice